who learned something really cool today? <laughs> I think the Rust Comp organizers deserve a round of applause for that. <laughs> um, all right. Um, I'm Julia. I'm on the internet. Uh, I work at Stripe. They helped get me here. That was wonderful. Um, cool. So I'm going to talk about a bunch of things in this talk. Um, I really care about a lot about learning systems programming. Um, and I'm going to talk about how Rust helps facilitate that. I'm going to talk about the particular ways in which I think the Rust community is wonderful. Um, we're going to talk about contributing without coding. Um, we've talked a lot about contributing with coding, uh, which is also wonderful. Um, and we're going to talk about learning all the time, which is my favorite thing. Um, so uh, there are a lot of reasons to love Rust. Uh, I hear that people love Rust because you can write fast and safe software. We've heard a lot about security. There are a lot of really great programming languages ideas. Um, and I am not a Rust wizard. Um, in fact, I live in a comet around Rust. <laughs> and I spend a great deal of my time quite far away um, being like, what is a borrow checker exactly? Like, I sort of know. Um, so I'm sort of like a maybe beginner intermediate Rust programmer, right? Um, and I do not write production Rust software um, at all. Um, instead, like for me, Rust is like a really good way to learn about systems, um, which is something I've spent a lot of time doing. It's a fun way to run experiments, and it's a good place to go to ask for help. Um, when I got invited to give this talk, which was like the best day ever, um, I, I got an email being like, so we like to think of Rust as being empowering for a wide variety of people who might not otherwise consider themselves systems programmers, right? And this is something which is really exciting to me. Um, so Rust is really good for experiments. Um, I like to do a lot of experiments. Um, I have some rules around programming experiments, uh, which is that they don't need to be very good. Um, it can be like a little tiny program, which like doesn't even work, right? Um, maybe it compiles, maybe it, it probably compiles. <laughs> maybe like, but that's, that's kind of like a minimum. Like maybe you probably want it to run. Um, but the only important thing is that you learned something, right? And then maybe you can tell someone what you learned. Um, and so uh, a few years ago, three years ago, I was kind of in this place where like, I'd been working as a web developer, I'd been working as a data scientist, um, I knew a whole bunch of programming languages, and I've been programming for a while, um, like for maybe 10, 9, 10 years. I, just, I had two computer science degrees, um, and I did not know what to learn next, right? Like, and I still felt like there was a lot I didn't know, um, which was true, right? Like, I wasn't a systems programmer, definitely. I just did a lot of math, and in math, you're like, what is a computer, right? <laughs> um, so I like, didn't really know, understand what my kernel did. Even though I'd been running Linux for a long time, I was confused about some basic facts. Um, I didn't know what a system call was. Um, I had a lot of really basic questions about how operating systems worked. Um, at this point in time, I went to the Recur Center, uh, which is one of my favorite places <laughs> in the world. Um, for those of you who do not applaud because you don't know what it is, um, the Recur Center is a 12-week program, um, a 12-week programming retreat where you go and you're like, what do I love about programming and what am I going to learn? <laughs> and you learn things on your own and you decide what's exciting to you. Um, I went there with a lot of questions about operating systems because I was like, what's really hard? Um, and I was like, building an operating system would be really hard, right? Um, and so I would ask, like, what's a system call? Because I didn't know what that was. And then someone was like, well, the way you tell your operating system to do things. Like when you open a file, your oper operating system knows how to open files. And then so you tell it with a system call. And I was like, oh, OK. Now I know what it is. Done. <laughs> um, I wanted to write an operating system, and I decided to do it in Rust. Um, and in, in particular, uh, an oper operating system is a really big thing. And I only had three weeks. <laughs> So this was like unlikely to work. So I focused on writing like a keyboard driver, right? Where you like type a key on your keyboard like J and it appears on the screen. I used to have a demo of this, but my Rust code has not compiled for the last three years because um, I wrote it in Rust 2013. Anyway, it's a whole thing. Um, so I wanted to write a keyboard driver and there were a lot of like questions involved. Like I needed to use like assembly and I needed to use strings in Rust and I was really confused about strings in Rust. Um, and two kind of delightful things happened. Um, one thing was that I would go to the Rust IRC channel and people would answer my Rust questions. And then sometimes they'd be like, why are you doing this? And I'd be like, well, I'm trying to do this thing with assembly. And then they would also answer my questions about like unrelated things like assembly. 
which was extremely helpful because I did not know the answers to those questions and I wasn't quite sure where to get them. Um, and we're gonna come back to that. Um, and I, I discovered this really interesting thing, um, which is like that even if you're like a relative beginner to a thing, um, like I was to Rust and to operating systems, you can somehow like still contribute information, right, to, to your community. Like, so I was writing this blog in 2013 where I, because I, I, I was at the Recurse Center and I had like, I didn't do anything else with my time. <laughs> so every, every night I would sit down and write a blog post, which is like, what is ELF? E ELF is um, the binary executable format on Linux. And I was like, what is it? And like, how does it work? And I was like, I tried to write a keyboard driver and yesterday it crashed and the day before it crashed and the day before it crashed, but today it didn't crash. <laughs> And I was so happy. Um, and I wrote like some BuzzFeed style articles, like 12 things I learned about linkers. <laughs> um, and I was, and it turned out that uh, not, in, in fact, like I didn't know this stuff and it turned out that other people also did not know any of this stuff, right? Um, and, and I could like contribute something even though uh, I was kind of a beginner. Um, and uh, there, there's this really interesting comment uh, in the opening, opening talk this morning, I think, I think by Nico, um, which is like, if it's not documented, it might as well not exist, right? So there's this idea that like, if you, um, if you don't know about something, uh, it might as well not exist, right? <laughs> in, in, in a way. Um, and so um, this is how I became a chief developer advocate for Estrus. <laughs> Because uh, one day someone told me about a program called Estrace that traces system calls. Um, and this was so like, it was so upsetting to me that I hadn't known that this existed for the last 10 years <laughs> that I kind of embarked on a campaign <laughs> to tell everyone I knew. Um, currently I have printed 500 stickers and I have a Estrace sticker on my phone. Anyway, <laughs> it got sort of out of hand. Um, but but the, the reason I kind of like doing this is like that I program in my, in my at my job, right? So I spend all day like doing code reviews and programming and like, you know, uh, writing design documents. And at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do another code review. It doesn't sound fun, right? <laughs> or it's, it's like too much the same. Um, but, what, but I do like to tell people about things. Um, and the kind of fun thing about telling people about things um, is if you're <laughs> building something, um, then you have to like build the whole thing and then tell people about it. Um, but you can do this cool trick where you just skip the building it part <laughs> and <laughs> find something really cool and tell people about it. And then people are like, wow, you're amazing. And you're like, I know, right? <laughs> I just invented S-Trace for you because <laughs> you didn't know about it before. <laughs> So it's basically like I wrote it. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, yeah, so that, 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 that's, a, that's my picture for telling people about things as a cool hack uh, to become the best programmer in the world. Um, but uh, if you actually want to write uh, programs and like learn systems programming, how do you do that, right? Um, and so I, I have this coworker uh, who asked, asked me yesterday, he was like, hey, I'm reading this Rust book. Um, and like, I've been learning about the syntax and like, but like, how do I, like what's like a good systems programming program to write? And I was like, good question, right? Like you wanna learn something, you don't really necessarily mind what you learn, you just want it to be new. Um, so we're gonna talk about another experiment, um, which is one evening at Julia's house. And Julia is like, okay, so like what's going on with concurrency, right? Uh, and so let, let, let's make this a little more concrete than like what's concurrency. Um, and there's this question of like, what are the systems primitives for concurrency, right? Like I have a computer, there are concurrent programs, and they're all kind of using the same stuff. Um, and so I was like, okay, I know there's threads. I know sometimes, I, I was really into S-trace, so I would S-trace things, and it would say Futex, and I wasn't totally clear on what Futex was, but I think <laughs> it's like it has something to do with concurrency, right? Um, and I knew that you had like atomic something, I don't know, right? Um, so I, I decided to, to do some programs. Um, Step one was I wrote a C program, because um, it's way easier to write unsafe C programs than unsafe Rust programs. <laughs> uh, cool feature of C. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and so I made like a thousand threads, and then all the threads would increment the same counter, right? Um, which is like how you get a race condition. And I'm like, I made a race condition. I'm so happy. <laughs> Extremely easy. Um, and I would run it and it would not get to a million, it would get to some lower number, right? And it was always a different number, and it was very exciting. Um, and I felt proud of myself, and I'd already succeeded, right? <laughs> I made a race condition. <laughs> Good job. Um, and then I was like, okay, I'm gonna learn about mutexes, right? And so I wrote, um, 
I figured out how to do it in C, um, which is use this function called like pthread mutex lock, I guess. Um, and then that maybe uses the futex system call. I was, uh, I showed this, this, this talk to someone before I gave it, and he was like, did you know that it only sometimes uses the futex system call, and also sometimes it'll just pull, and I was like, oh, it's so complicated. <laughs> Such a world of, <laughs> of excitement inside this little tiny problem of you're just like trying to increment a counter. Um, so I did this, I used a mutex uh, where you're just like, okay, I'm updating this counter, I'm gonna like, let me know when I'm allowed, <laughs> and then you update it, and you're like, okay, I'm done, and then someone else does it after. And that worked, and that was great. And I felt like I knew what a mutex was a little bit, uh, which was good. And I also felt like I knew like, what system calls were happening, which is good. Um, and then I was like, okay, so this is atomic thing. What's up with that? So I Googled, I was like, atomic computer, I don't know, <laughs> not atomic computer, <laughs> but something smart. Um, and what, what, what I figured out uh, on that day uh, was that you have these uh, atomic instructions for x86, right? Where you're like, please increment this, but like in a, in a smart, good way, um, where, uh, where you, you like put a lock around it. But it's just like one CPU instruction. Um, and then this actually explained like, so um, I got uh, in like somewhat earlier, I think also in 2013, um, I was like looking at this job and someone uh, emailed me this uh, list of questions and they were like, can you discuss like the pros and cons of implementing a lock-free hash table? Um, and this was kind of interesting because uh, at the time I had no idea what this meant. <laughs> and no idea how to discuss the pros and cons. And I was like, this seems very interesting, but I'm really confused. Um, and then so when I learned about these atomic instructions, I was like, oh, I would like use atomic instructions, I see. And then like, I still don't know the pros and cons of implementing like a lock-free hash table, and that's okay. Uh, maybe one day I'll learn that. Uh, okay, um, but the, the, so this leaves us with kind of like a fun exercise, right? You could like write a multi-threaded program where all the threads in, increment the same counter and you could do it two different ways and then maybe you'll know something more about systems programming than you did when you started. Um, okay, um, so that's it for experiments and like fun things. And like these are all nice because they're sort of all sort of like unproductive in one way, right? Like you're not producing new wonderful code that's gonna change the world, but they're producing a lot of like knowledge in yourself and maybe in other people, which is really nice. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about actually writing programs because um, I wrote a program in Rust recently, maybe for the first time actually, <laughs> like a program that does something useful that had previously been a very low priority for me. Um, and so I wanna talk about this idea that like Rust makes kind of improbable programs possible. I, I originally wrote impossible, but I'm really, so like, you can write any program you want in C, right, in principle. <laughs> but it is somewhat improbable that I would write a complicated program in C uh, for reasons that are going to become apparent shortly. Um, so it's, it's sort of important to me that Rust exists, right? Um, and this is where we get back to this idea that like Rust is empowering, right? And you're like, oh, maybe I can write that program, right? <laughs> Um, and empowerment is just like about being able to do stuff. It's like maybe you can do stuff with Rust that like you wouldn't really do otherwise. Um, so, so, so here's like the kind of problem I was interested in. <laughs> um, is Ruby is, uh, is taking all your CPU and you're like, you're ruining my day, Ruby. Why are you doing that, right? And you wanna know why. Um, and I was a little mad about this because uh, you can see what Chrome is doing actually. So let me start a video in Chrome really quickly. Uh, I'm not gonna put on the sound, well I could, no, I won't. Anyway, you, you, you might know this video. Um, and if I run uh, perf top, let me just, um, okay, uh, so then you can see there are some functions in Chrome that are happening. Um, this is what's happening right now on my computer. And there's this function like scale YUV to RGB 32 row SSE, I don't know. Um, so I don't know what this is, um, but I do know that it's taking up 3.59% of my CPU right now. Um, and that's like some internal function in Chrome. And it was kind of upsetting to me that I could learn this about Google Chrome in like approximately three seconds. Um, you can also see pthread mutex lock down there. Um, it's real, <laughs> it's a real function, it's happening. 0.53%. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it was kind of upsetting to me that I could do this uh, with Chrome, but not with Ruby, right? Because like, why not? I was mad. Um, so um, what, what I wanted to do was write like, kind of like a Ruby top thing, right? Which would tell me what Ruby was doing. Um, that's supposed to say PID, but it looks like PIP. That was, I, was supposed to, I was supposed to fix that and I didn't. Anyway, um, 
so yeah, let's say you wanted to do this. Um, and I'm really, uh, I don't know anything about Ruby internals, and I was really scared of them. So I wanted to do something which is like outside of the Ruby process. Um, and so the idea is that like, you kind of have some running Ruby process, and you spy on it from the outside, and you want to see what it's doing. Um, and so um, basically what happened is, uh, I, I thought this was kind of, I was talking to someone about this, and they were like, Julia, you can totally do this, it's really easy. Like, just, just go do it over a weekend. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not sure I can do this. <laughs> um, but it, uh, I, I decided to try, because uh, this guy I was talking to claimed it was totally easy. Um, <laughs> And so, so, so the situation um, that he kind of impressed on me over many weeks, because he'd be like, it's easy. And he's like, have you done it yet? I'm like, no. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so, so, so you kind of have this picture, right? Um, and so you can see over there, you have like the C stack um, in like the Ruby virtual machines address space, right? There's like its regular stack, which has uh, unhelpful functions like VM exec or something, um, which is just like, I'm running a Ruby function. And you're like, great, <laughs> really helpful. <laughs> Um, and then somewhere else you have like the Ruby stack, right? Which has like, I don't know, functions like Rails something. I don't know Rails. <laughs> I just assume all the functions are called Rails. Uh, <laughs> um, and then maybe there's like extra information like function names that's like scattered all over the place. Um, but in there, like inside the virtual machines process somewhere, there's information about the Ruby stack, right? Like it's not impossible to know what, what, it, what it's doing. Um, and so I kind of like learned, I had this GDB script and I translated it into a program uh, that didn't use features. It's, anyway, I'm not gonna go into this. Um, but I wrote a C demo. Um, and so I know, I, know, I know C sort of. Uh, I know how to allocate memory in C. Uh, <laughs> um, it, technically, I know that you can free memory in C and I have called free before. Uh, <laughs> but memory management in C, in C is not a skill I have, right? Um, and I didn't really, I wasn't really excited uh, about learning it. Um, so, so uh, I, I sort of know Rust, but I'm not like uh, super good at it. Uh, so I talked to my partner, and I was like, well, I have this C demo. And he was like, well, like, let's just translate it to Rust. And I was like, yeah, let's just translate it to Rust. So he translated it to Rust and took like a couple hours, right? Um, and this kind of helps with my productivity. Um, I have this highly scientific me metric of program workingness. <laughs> so it kind of went up. And then I switched to Rust, and then I was like, oh, I see, there are hash tables in Rust. I don't need to like, write those from scratch, right? Um, or whatever. I don't know what C programmers do. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just don't know, right? Like, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, I, I could look it up, right? Like, like it's not impossible to learn C. Um, <laughs> I have not done it. <laughs> um, so, so, so this was pretty helpful. Um, I, but then I ran into a second pr problem. Um, which is like, if you have a process, you have a bunch of memory in your process, right? Which is like zero, one, zero, zero, right? There's a, some bytes and stuff. Um, and you might wanna know what those bytes mean, right? If you're like spying on the process. Um, and in particular, there might be some struct, right? Which has like a pointer, a length. Um, and if you know about compilers, um, which you, uh, I don't know. Uh, then co compilers like will throw away a lot of this information, right? About like what the structs in your pro program are. And they'll do like, oh, I don't know. Uh, and they'll just like do a lot of pointer arithmetic. Um, so you won't know if you're looking at this like zero one zero zero one, and you think it's like an RB string T. You won't know like what it, like what all those bytes mean, right? Um, so what you want to do is you want to have like the original struct definition. So you can say like, okay, the first four bytes are a pointer, the next four bytes are a length, and then the next sixteen bytes are a weird thing. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I, I needed to do this, um, and it turns out there's a debugging program called Dwarf, uh, which has this. Uh, which is, uh, it's a whole thing. Um, so I started out using this library called the Dwarf, <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what's going on. This API is really difficult to use. It was also slow, and I had to link it, and it was like a whole, it was kind of a mess. And uh, I, I spent, I wrote like 500 lines of like Rust wrappers for live Dwarf functions, and I was kind of having a bad day. <laughs> um, I, I think I stopped working on this for like three weeks, because I didn't know what to do. And I would kind of complain to people, and they'd be like, yeah, that sucks. But like, <laughs> um, so, so, so one thing that, that, that I do when I have problems is I complain about them on Twitter. Uh, and someone was like, hey, there's this, there's this Rust library called Gimli. Uh, and one, one of the people who works on the library, Nick, Nick Fitzgerald, who I got to meet today, um, was like, hey, yeah, it's like not done, but maybe it'll help you. And like, tell me if I can help. And I was like, oh, sweet. This is way better than LibDwarp, which is just like this like software from the 90s or something um, that like, I don't know what to do with. Maybe it's not, I don't know when it's from. Anyway. Um, so, um, Gimli had less features, um, than, like, uh, but it was easier to read. I could like go look at it, um, 
and they had like friendly maintainers, and I would be like, I have a question. They'll be like, I will help explain to you how Dwarf works, <laughs> which was really nice. And I submitted like a three-line pull request, uh, which is my like open source contribution for the year. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so the, the the key thing here was actually that um, this let me get my program to work, um, which is something I could not do before. Like I got it like 90% working with LibDwarf, uh, but 90% it means nothing to your computer. <laughs> Um, so I actually got my program to work. Uh, it worked on three different computers. And, and I started to kind of understand how Dwarf worked, which was really nice, right? Because we like understanding systems and systems programming. Um, and I was like, oh, I get it. Like, there are these different, so in a program, you have these different ELF sections. Um, so you have code, and you have code, and you have data. And then Dwarf like, put some extra debug sections at the end, um, which are just like extra train cars, um, really. Um, and then there's this, like, a, I mean, that's like only like step zero of knowing how it works. You have to also know what's in all those sections and what it all means, and it's a whole, uh, I was talking to someone who worked on GDV, and he was like, "This is a whole saga." <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, and then so 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 we did it, and I actually got this to work, um, which was very exciting. Uh, I can show you sort of a demo. Um, so this is my uh, Jekyll, my blog building in a loop, right? Um, and then oh no, that's not it. Seven oh eight eight. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so these are like the functions that are running right now. I made like kind of a list of, uh, maybe I need to make this smaller. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so it's doing parse. Parse seems to be really important. Sanitized path seems to be important. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but you can kind of see like a top list of like the functions that are running. Um, and it's all like real. Uh, and so I felt kind of happy with myself. <laughs> Uh, I, I learned that desktop software is really hard. I mostly work on servers. It runs on my computer and also two other people's computers. I have no, no knowledge that it works on more than three. <laughs> uh, um, and so, uh, like, I, I often find Rust kind of kind of frustrating because I'm like, oh, there's a compiler, and like, what does this compiler mean? Uh, but like, ultimately, it helps me do kind of awesome things, right? And I can I can write some programs that I couldn't really write before, um, which which is really exciting to me. Um, I have some closing like, like a whole bunch of statements. Um, I guess uh, I'm really into like uh, learning all the time, as you may have noticed. Um, and like one, one really fun th thing about systems is that, like there's always more stuff to learn, right? Like I keep on meeting people who are like, yeah, I've, I've been working with Linux for the last like 15 years, and like I learned a really cool new thing yesterday, and I'm like, great. <laughs> I'm in no danger of knowing everything. <laughs> Um, and I, I found it really fun to like contribute to the community by like blogging and writing things. And like th this is really cool, right? Because um, it can be it can be a lot faster than contributing by writing code if you if you like writing. Um, I often will like write a blog post in like in like a couple of hours. Cause I'll be like, I learned a cool thing about estrace. Here's the cool thing. Goodbye. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Um, and uh, another one, one thing about. Uh, blogging that I'm really into is making resources for like kind of intermediate developers. Um, I, I used to find it frustrating when like I would see a lot of really cool tutorials about how, learning how to program, like learn Python the hard way, and like those are really important. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, I know how to program. What I want to know is more things. <laughs> um, and I think it's really fun to write things like you're like, oh, this is how a database works. And you're, you could be like, oh, I've been using databases for six years, but I never knew how it worked, right? Um, and there's like there's, there's always like so much more to know even if you've been learning, even if you've been knowing how to program for a long time. Um, and uh, one one cool thing that you can do when you're doing this is like make things sound like exactly as hard as they are. Um, I think a really good example of this is computer networking. Uh, when I started learning about networking, I was like, networking is hard. It's confusing. I don't know what's happening. Um, what I realized is like. Now that I know some things about networking, I'm like, well, like with an IP packet, um, you have an IP address and a port. And if you know there's an IP address and a port on a packet, you already know a lot. And you can explain that to like almost anyone, right? <laughs> like, or like you, and, and like maybe you need to explain what a port is. Um, but like a lot of the concepts are like not um, that unapproachable. And so I wrote this zine um, called like Linux debugging tools you'll love. Um, which uh, about, about, and especially, and it included a bunch of stuff about networking, and someone sent this kind of like, tweeted this really surprising thing at me, where they're like, I've been using it to teach my eight-year-old. 
And I'm like, I don't think that you're teaching your eight-year-old about TCP enough. <laughs> I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> um, but it's really like charming and delightful to me <laughs> that people are like, oh yeah, anyone could learn this stuff. My eight-year-old could learn this stuff. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> well, like, I'm, I'm glad, right? <laughs> Like, it's good. And sometimes, like, more people can learn more, like, like people can learn harder things than you think that they can if you just explain it in a way that makes sense. Um, which is really cool. Um, and it means that we have to, like, maybe get rid of our conceptions of ourselves as wizards. But maybe not, because uh, I have a wizard hat right there, right? Um, and I, I think that the Rust community is a really good place to do this, um, because I've been meeting all these people today who know all these amazing things, which are not necessarily related to Rust, right? But they're all here together. Um, and I'm like, oh, you know all about like debugging tools, or you know all about like Linux, right? Um, and it's, it's like really delightful to me to have like all this knowledge about things that are not necessarily Rust, but that's like, that are important to each other, and, like important and related to each other, like kind of in the same place. Um, and I think that's really cool. Um, and so what, what, what I really want to close with is um, that I think, I think it's really nice to have a place where you can kind of walk in and you can be like, what's the system call? And then you can walk out like many, many questions later and be like, oh, I can do systems programming now. Uh, it wasn't that hard. I'm a wizard. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm a fan of the Rust community. Please keep being awesome. That's all.